Welcome, happy Sabbath to the France Pass Seventh day Adventist Church service. I um, want to welcome all those that are here. We want to welcome all those that are viewing by live streaming, those that are maybe watching later on on YouTube or um, through Better Life Television, through the church service that the worship hour there. So, um, starting next week, Starting next week, we are going to be changing up our church service a bit. Still getting a little humming going on there. Okay. Okay. So uh, you know, here we are just finally getting back to church, and now we're going to change things up a little bit. But I, it's a good thing. It's a good thing because we're actually going to be going to two worship services. Because, as you know, before COVID hit, we were getting sometimes up to 300 people. And then we had it where we could only have, you know, just 25 people when it first hit. And then it went up to 100 people we could have. And now, as long as we uh, do six foot distancing, we can even do more people, which we get to, but we figured about 140, 150 people, depending on families. But we want everybody to be able to come. And so we've, uh, um, through the, leadership of Pastor Tanner, we are actually going to be doing a a first service at 9 a.m. And it's going to be geared more toward families. And uh, but that doesn't mean uh, singles can't come. Anybody can come to it, but that's going to be more the um, the focus, the emphasis. So uh, just know it's going to be maybe a little more. It's going to be more of a a different kind of service, not going to be the traditional service. So and the fact it's going to be more, a little more cut and dried, too, because it's only going to be an hour, exactly an hour, from 9 to 10. And then we will have um, Sabbath school from 10.15 to 11.15. And then we'll have our traditional worship service, and that will begin at 11.30. Okay? So just so you know, the reason why we're doing this, we want everybody to be able to come. And so right now there may be people that not, may not be able to come. And so we want everybody to be able to come. So we're, make, we're making an opportunity for those that for whatever reason we're not coming can now come. Also, we have some second readings of membership to, uh, to uh, read off here. We have Dave and Debbie Crick are going to the Gateway Seventh-day Adventist Church. Tom and Kathy Driver are transferring to the Seventh Day Adventist, uh, Gateway Seventh Day Adventist Church, and Dave, Jen, Brandon, and Dylan Morse are transferring to the Gateway Seventh Day Adventist Church. So, do I have a motion for that? Do I have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. All in favor, raise hands. Thank. All opposed, same sign. Okay, carries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Also, it's that time of year. We're getting close. Well, I shouldn't say that time of year because we only do it once every two years now. And uh, that is nominating committee. And so usually right around the 1st of February is where we begin doing our selection for those on the nominating committee. So in your bulletins, you will see a little nominating committee ballot. Okay. And so what we'd like you to do is to put five names down of individuals that you would would like to recommend to be on the nominating committee. And so the names that are already on the ballot are names you cannot submit because they served two years ago. So we don't have people serving two consecutive terms. So anybody, and then you'll have this list also in your bulletin of all the people that are active members in our church so that um, from this list that, and it's, you know, multiple page list that you can choose five names that you would like to see um, be involved in our nominating committee. And for those that are not able, not able to be here today, because obviously we don't have our whole church service here, you will be um, uh, emailed a, uh, is it emailed or is it mailed that she says is going to be doing here? Um, it's going to be emailed. We're going to email you a link to the ballot so that you can actually submit your five names as well, okay? And then you can return that via email as well, okay? So remember, uh, f- uh, fill out your five names and then you can leave them at the back there. There's a basket by the information desk where you can leave your ballot of who you'd like to select as the five names you wanna have on the, on the nominating committee. 
As far as any other announcements, as you know, a very active church here, even with COVID going on. And so there's many, many more announcements of things that are happening in our church. So if you don't miss out on it, please read your bulletins to know what's, what else is going on in our church. Thank you. Good morning. You know, on that day when the, uh, the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. How about it? We'll be there. Amen. Let's sing about that this morning. When the roll is called up yonder, verses one and two. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll While we're waiting here on earth to hear that roll, you know, perhaps we have that quiet place, and it may be in the garden alone, while the dew is still in the roses, and we hear that voice falling on our ear speaking to us. Let's sing about that this morning, in the garden, verses 1 and 2. song is 268 and if you notice there's a new addition in the pews and it's the hymnal so many of you don't know this I didn't know this I thought I did I didn't 
So if you can read music, sometimes this helps you with these new songs. So this is going to be our opening song. Let's stand and sing all four verses, Holy Spirit, Light Divine. Take in the words, they're fabulous. As we have just sung, Lord, we desire for your Holy Spirit to be here. And you've said, uh, if we ask, you will be. And so, Lord, we thank you for being here. We pray that you would impress upon our hearts the things you would have us to learn here today. We sing your praises, Lord, because of the redemptive work you've done in each of our behalves, that we will be able, when that role is called up yonder, to be there. Thank you, Lord. Be with us and bless us as only you can today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, boys and girls. How many of you have heard the verse about the mustard seed? It goes like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in a field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it grow, is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air can lodge in the branches thereof. Did you know that every raindrop has a seed? Well, not really seed, it's a piece of dust. And maybe you've noticed after it rains that there's dust on your windows or raindrops leave their spots on the windows of a car and the house. Sometimes you've, maybe you've even helped wash it off. Well, that dust is important because the raindrop cannot even form unless it has a speck of dust to form on. Now, once a raindrop forms, it can be either good or bad. It can fall to the earth and bring to a thirsty plant a welcome drink. It can water our fields. And that's a good thing. Um, when it's, uh, however, if it's cold, it may actually form ice crystals. And what we find is beautiful snowflakes that form when it's cold. 
And did you know that each snowflake is different and unique? Scientists have never found a snowflake that looks the same, just like you and I are each unique. However, if it's cold and the wind's blowing and it's stormy, it can actually blow that raindrop or snowflake back up into the air. And it gets up there high in the sky and it forms ice on it again. And it starts to fall to the earth, but the wind can blow it up again. And then it gets more water on it and more ice on it. And guess what's happening? You're forming a ball of ice and we call that a hailstone. And at some point, the hailstone gets big enough that the wind can't blow it up anymore and it comes crashing to the ground. That's not a good thing. If it's in the summertime, it can tear up your, the leaves of the crops and damage the crops. It's been known to just really damage cars and even houses. And believe me, you don't want to be out there and be hit by them because they don't feel good at all. They can get maybe as big as baseballs. They don't usually get that big. But the, uh, in 2003, they found a 7-inch hailstone in Nebraska. And then in 2010, they found an 8-inch one in Dakotas. And last year, they found another 80-inch one that fell in Libya. So um, they can get big. They usually don't get that big, but they can be dangerous. So we should remember, though, that raindrops and hailstones start the same way. They, all, they both start with a tiny speck of dust, that little seed. One is good, one is bad. And what determines whether it's good or bad is what happens to it before it comes down to the ground. Well, we want, as Christians, we need a tiny seed of faith that God can help grow in our hearts. If we ask him, he will give us that seed of faith and we can become a raindrop for him. Of course, raindrops don't have choices whether they can become raindrops or snowflakes or hailstones, but you do. I want to be a raindrop for Jesus, don't you? Now it's time for our worship and giving, and we will, um, we're going to have prayer shortly here. But before we do, um, just want to let you know that there are different ways you can give. First of all, I want to say praise the Lord and thank you for your faithful giving. Even in the midst of COVID, we are actually in the black, which many times even before COVID, we weren't in the black. But I believe that the Lord has definitely been blessing this church, and especially as we're doing, I know we have our, our foreign missions we've been very blessed with, and uh, and exceeded our uh, goals for those. And, and um, we're told inspiration as we take care of the, the, the foreign work, the Lord will take care of the, the homework. And so uh, again, I just wanna thank everyone for their faithfulness and their, and their giving. And um, there, are, there are multiple ways you can give. One, you can give the temple boxes in the back for your tithes and offerings, or you can mail it into the church office. You can do it online or there's a little box there, right there at the door of the, the office, where the secretary's office is, you can give that way as well. And this week's uh, offering is for our local church budget. As you know, our local church budget is, we have many, many ministries going on, also for utilities and things to take care of this church, the maintenance of this church. But again, many ministries that are going on too that they get funded through our, our local church budget as well, especially our school. Our school is definitely one of our biggest ministry outreaches. 
So uh, again, uh, many different ways you can, you can uh, give. And just again, thank you for your faithfulness in your giving. Father in heaven, Lord, um, thank you how you have provided for our needs, Lord. And as you have given us to provide for what we need, Lord, you've told us that as the, as the, um, the uh, birds of the air don't sow or reap, you take care of them. You'd say the, the flowers, Lord, you take care of them, Lord. So you provide for our needs, Lord, as we, um, as we choose to follow you, that you are faithful. And so, Lord, as we give back to you these tithes and offerings, may you multiply them so that they can do the work that you would have them to do so that we can finish the work and go home and be with you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. So nice to see more and more church family here. Yes. One of these days, fellowship and all that hopefully will happen. We're going to be reading today from the New King James Version, Acts 2, 1 through 4, the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Should we turn it on? Oh, it's on? It's on? Okay. As far as everybody can kneel, let us kneel for prayer. Dear Lord, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord. You are holy, holy, holy. And we just thank you for the blessings that you have given us. We ask, Lord, that you be with us today with your holy angels and your Holy Spirit. Uh, just search our hearts, Lord. Uh, we ask to give us that faith of a mustard seed, Lord, that uh, we can grow in faith and we can move mountains for you. We thank you, Lord, and we ask uh, also, there's so, one, uh, so many people sick in our church, and we just pray for the, each one of those that you heal their bo um, body, mind, and soul, and that if they need anything, uh, let them reach out. We pray for all those who are out in the cold, Lord. Uh, we see how many homeless there are, and we just pray for each one of those, Lord, that uh, if we can help, let us help. Uh, we know that uh, they're there, uh, but we know that uh, they could be suffering. We pray also, Lord, to hunger so much, hunger and thirst uh, for your righteousness, that we ask that the Holy Spirit uh, be with us and that it would uh, just spark a fire in us, Lord, to preach uh, and praise your name everywhere we go. We ask, Lord, that also um, that this nation right now is in chaos. And through chaos, uh, you bring peace. And through hate and violence, you bring love. So we pray, Lord, that uh, our love can shine through and that uh, we can show everyone that uh, there is hope. And we also pray, Lord, that for our nation right now, that uh, it's going through things, but we know uh, that you're in control every single of the way. So we ask that the Holy Spirit be with us, Lord, trim our lamps, get us ready for heaven, and that uh, no one should perish and that you promise uh, to be there for us. Again, we thank you for Jesus, your son, who died for us, Lord, on that cross for what we deserve, and then he gave us what he deserves. So we pray this in all the holy name of Jesus. Amen.
the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, I am, I am, I am the root of David. The bright and morning star I am the lion of Judah I am I am I'm faithful and true I am the And he that lives, I am alive forever. Amen. Amen. I am the King of kings and Lord of lords. I am holy. Holy Lord, God Almighty, which was and is to come, I am, I am, I am, I'm faithful. Many years ago, my wife and I left our home in the mountains of North Carolina and set out to see a little bit the beauty of this country of ours. We had both lived overseas much of our lives and wanted to get better acquainted with our own homeland. First, we explored portions of the Santa Fe and Oregon trails. Then, we visited some of our national parks, including the Tetons and Yellowstone. The scenery was great, 
and the hot springs and the geysers were really exceptional. One of the unique things about Yellowstone that I hadn't realized before is the plethora of wild game that you find there. It's not as plentiful as East Africa, but it is very impressive. People were taking pictures of bears, other animals, everywhere along the road. And frequently the road was clogged and we just had to sit and watch with them. Some of the best scenery was along the Pacific coast. Wait. I'm getting used to this. There, there we are. Some of the best scenery was along the Pacific coast and we cruised much of the coastal route from Washington State on south to Southern California. Oregon, of course, has some of the best. In brief, we saw a lot of beautiful country. One Sabbath morning, we attended church in a little town in the mountains of Oregon. After the service, it was raining cats and dogs. We were driving down one of the main streets in town. My windshield wipers were whipping back and forth at top speed. I was adjusting my AC, trying to keep the windshield from fogging up. When suddenly I looked up and saw something that intrigued me. And through the rain, I could see above the street in big, bold letters, there was a sign that read, it's the climate. I smiled to myself and uh, I thought, what's so great about this? Water was splashing everywhere. Somebody has really gotten carried away. Well, several years later, we moved to that little town and I soon learned that the climate was really very nice. We've enjoyed the mild winters and the bright sunny summers. Climate is a very important part of life for each one of us. It influences the way we dress, how we feel, the things we do, even our outlook on life. Major world migrations have taken place because people were searching for a better climate. Back in ancient times, God used the climate of Palestine to teach a very important Bible truth. This morning, I want to examine that truth just briefly. Please turn with me to the book of Joel and read there from chapter two, verse 23. I'll be reading in the KJV. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. In order to better understand what Joel is saying in this verse, we need to know a little about the climate of Palestine. For those of us who have lived in California, it's not hard to picture the type of climate that Joel is talking about. The climates of Palestine and Southern California have much in common. For example, Haifa and San Diego are the same distance north of the equator. They both have large bodies of water to the west, and they both have what climatologists call 
a Mediterranean climate. Very briefly, let's examine the main characteristics of this type of climate. Mediterranean climates are located on the western sides of major land masses in the subtropics, or that is just out of the tropics. They are characterized by mild, wet winters and warm to hot, dry summers. There are five main areas of this type of climate in the world, two north of the equator and three in the southern hemisphere. Now, what do the climatic patterns of Palestine have to do with Bible truth? In Palestine, the rains normally begin in late October or sometimes in early November. Then they continue until the following spring. The first rains to arrive in the autumn are called the early rains or sometimes the former rains. They soften the soil after a long hot summer and this permits the wheat and the barley to be planted more easily. The grain grows during the mild, wet winter and is tall and green by springtime. Then the rain at the end of the rainy season or in April or May, it's, it's called the latter rain. And this helps the grain to mature for the coming harvest. Notice how the Apostle Peter applies the prophecy to his day. Speaking of the events of Pentecost, he says in Acts, the second chapter, reading there from the 15th through the 17th verses, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. After Jesus' ascension to heaven, the disciples returned to the city of Jerusalem. About 120 men and women assembled in the upper room, as Jesus had commanded them to do. During that 10-day period before Pentecost, the Bible tells us they waited for the promise, the promise of the Father which was a promise for power. And they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Can you picture Jesus' disciples in one accord? Apparently, a major change had taken place in their lives. And notice it says they continued with one accord. The word continued tells us they kept on, they persevered in this oneness. And that word supplication suggests that they pled for help in deep humility. During these 10 days, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. They came close together, putting away all differences and the desire for supremacy. They prayed earnestly for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What was their main concern in praying for the Holy Spirit? Well, they recognized they needed the Holy Spirit so they could lead others to Christ. 
The Bible tells us they also visited the temple, praising and witnessing for their master. This was probably the most important 10-day period in the history of the early church. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, about 120 of them, pleading with God for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Notice what happened. And I'm reading there from Acts, the second chapter, verses two through four. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. In the book of Acts of the Apostles, page 30, it tells us, the Holy Spirit was to be given them in its fullness, sealing them for their work. Without being sealed by the Holy Spirit, they could never have done what they did. After that upper room infilling of the Holy Spirit, the apostles went out and preached Jesus Christ with power. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost is recorded for us in the second chapter of Acts. You're all acquainted with that, I'm sure. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost is recorded for us there in the second chapter of Acts. When the people heard Peter's powerful appeal, it tells us they were pricked at the heart and asked, what shall we do? Then Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit gave the young Christian church what it needed to become an established, growing reality in the world. From that dramatic beginning, it spread rapidly to many lands. Imagine what was taking place only 120 men and women, and their assignment was to reach the estimated 200 million people around the world. <coughs> and we're told they went to the uttermost parts of the earth. I've had the privilege of visiting the site where the Apostle Thomas is said to have died, a martyr for Christ in Tamil Nadu, South India. The promise that Peter claimed is also for us today. The latter rain or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit prepares the church for the final harvest just before Christ's second coming. Note what it says in the book, Great Controversy. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. In another place it says, if this prophecy of Joel met a partial fulfillment in the days of the apostles, we are living in a time when it is to be even more evidently manifest 
to the people of God. He will so bestow his spirit upon his people that they will become a light amid the moral darkness. And great light will be reflected in all parts of the world. According to the inspired word, our church has some of its best days ahead. With the leading of the Holy Spirit in Pentecostal power, the apostles reached much of the world within a period of only 30 years. Starting with 120 spirit-filled men and women, they changed the world. Today, our church has been in business for 158 years. We number close to 23 million, and we're in 213 different countries worldwide. And we're growing by about 1 million each year. Certainly, a great work has been done, and we have much to thank God for. But we are still waiting for the latter rain. As we look at the situation around us today, obviously things are much more complex than they were in the days of the apostles. We have leaders on numerous levels worldwide, from the General Conference on down through the divisions, the unions, and the conference to that level. Then we have local leadership in well over 163,000 churches around the world. In addition to that, we have complex educational, medical, and publishing entities around the world. How can we have an upper room experience when we're scattered everywhere around the globe? That's a rather challenging question, and I think only God can answer it fully. But the inspired word does shed some light on the matter. Since preparing for Pentecost was very much an individual matter for Christ's disciples, it must also be a personal matter for you and me. Their example would be a, an excellent guide. I like the way Leroy Froom puts it in his book, The Coming of the Comforter. He says, although true love begins at the cross, all true service begins with a personal Pentecost, a personal infilling of the Holy Spirit. If we draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to us. Unless the showers of the early rain have done their work on our hearts, the latter rain will be of no effect in our own lives. Let's expand on that thought briefly. We're told that without the early or former rain, we'll not experience the latter rain. The Lord's messenger says, Many have, in a great measure, failed to receive the former rain. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. When the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. She says they are making a terrible mistake. Every follower of Christ needs to linger in the upper room, making effectual the early rain, preparing their hearts for the mighty latter rain to come. In another place it says, 
Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern it or receive it. But we know that preparing for the latter rain is not only an individual matter, it's, it also has a corporate aspect as well. The nucleus of the early church met together in the upper room, preparing and praying for Pentecost. Think what might happen if the members in every church around the world were to come together praying and preparing for the outpouring of the latter rain. And I would suggest that this is where leadership could have an important place. One of the responsibilities of our church administrators at all levels is to lead out in this important matter. When Jesus said to his disciples, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. That promise was for us also. Sometimes people say, I wish Jesus were here today, walking and talking among us. That would be nice, of course, but we have God with us in the person of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. In fact, we live in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. God has provided for all our spiritual needs. As we look around us in the world today, we are confronted with a variety of apparent impossibilities, not the least of which is the excessive growth of population worldwide. Every year our planet is growing by a little over 70 million people. Add to that the moral decline we're seeing worldwide. There is no way we can accomplish what is expected of us without outside help. When we see the magnitude of the problem, it's obvious we're completely unable to do the job on our own. What we need is the quickening influence of the Holy Spirit, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Pray without ceasing and watch by working in accordance with your prayers. As you pray, believe, trust in God. It is the time of the latter rain when the Lord will give largely of his spirit. Be fervent in prayer, and watch in the Spirit. When God promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, he placed all the riches of heaven at our disposal. The angels must wonder why we don't ask for more help than we do. As human beings, we can baptize with water but only God can baptize with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ezekiel spoke of a valley of dry bones. Mankind can preach to dry bones, but only the Holy Spirit can make them get up and live. Israel spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, 
when they probably could have gone through in about 11 days. The only way we'll ever cross Jordan is by uh, an om omnipotent hand opening the way for us. Many years ago, we moved to Berrien Springs, Michigan, where I began my first year as a university professor there. The first Tuesday of the school year, I attended the required assembly in the university gymnasium. Mikhail Kulikov, the head of our church work in the former Soviet Union, was the scheduled speaker that day. I was eager to hear about all the work in that part of the world, so I found a seat uh, towards the front on an aisle where I could hear quite well. The students were generating a fair amount of commotion as they were taking their seats. Everyone had to select a, a folding chair and put it up. So the noise was rather normal in the gymnasium. But when the vice president introduced Elder Kulikov and he began to speak, things didn't get much better. In fact, I heard very little of what our guest speaker had to say. I decided that was my last assembly. The following Thursday, a required chapel service took place in the university church. I thought to myself, um, things will go better in the church. So I went and I arrived a bit early and found a seat on the very back row near a door, just in case. Well, as it turned out, the noise level was about the same, disappointingly high. I was getting ready to leave when the vice president stood up and made a brief announcement. He said, instead of having a regular chapel service this morning, we're going to have a testimony service. I groaned inside and thought to myself, who is going to testify in this environment? But suddenly, everything changed. There was a surge. A line of students formed down front and the testimonies began. I couldn't believe what was taking place. All the chatter ceased. The student body was dead silent. Everyone was listening intently. One after another, they told how they had experienced a conversion during the summer. How they had invited Jesus to come into their hearts. The bell rang, marking the end of the chapel service, but the testimonies continued. For about four hours, the student body stayed and testified. God had done a marvelous work in their hearts. The Holy Spirit had worked in a very powerful way, and that changed the chemistry of the whole school year. The revival that took place at the beginning of that school year was just a very small foretaste of what God wants for his people at the end of time. My friends, the sun is setting on this old world of ours. 
Christ is waiting with longing desire for his people to make themselves ready so he can pour out his promised blessing, the promise of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray for the latter rain. We need to prepare for the latter rain. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as God's people clearing the way for the Lord to pour out his spirit upon his church. Today, it's not long until we see our Lord coming in the clouds of heaven and the redeemed will proclaim him and crown him Lord of all. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthems drown all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Closing song today, let's stand and sing Crown Him with Many Crowns, <clears throat> verses 1, 3, and 4. Father, we're thankful for the privilege of living in these very challenging times. We pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst and in each of our hearts, that his presence will continue with us through the rest of this Sabbath and in the days and years ahead. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.